It's nice to be back here preaching here. I've been preaching in Durango and Cortez and Aztec. and I need a couple more churches, and I'm in four states. Uh, today, um, we're going to be discussing um, a concept that uh, has not been known about. Uh, after the fall, 5,945 years later, we find a uh, thing called creation's secret signature. That's something that modern man has found as to who created. So we're going to look at that today. And so we have some questions for you. Why do we worship God? Why do we do that? Is it important to know why? Maybe, maybe we don't need to know why. It's important to know why. Okay, is it because Jesus died for us on the cross? Oh, there's different answers now. Or is it because he's the creator? Some of you are going to get political. You're going to want it both. Or is it primarily just one of the two choices? Does it make a difference? Is the answer maybe that Christ died for us because he is the creator, therefore we worship the creator? Amen. There, we put it all together. But is that accurate? Is that right? If mankind would not have sinned, why would we have continued to worship God? Obviously, it would be that God was the creator, right? So, because man sinned, has a reason for worshiping God changed? In Revelation, what does it say that the main issue will be at the end of time? What's the main thing? Get it down to one word. And it has to do with worship. Is this going to pop up up here? There we are. All right. Okay, let's see here. All right. I was doing so well, too. All right, see, all, there's all those questions. I thought you were reading right with me. All right, let's get down here. Let's get to where we were. Okay, next screen here. Because man sinned, has a reason for worshiping God changed? Okay, if we hadn't have sinned, we'd have worshiped him because he was creator. But because we sin, now it's something else. In Revelation, what does it say the main issue is at the end of time? Down to one word, Revelation is worship. So it could be critical why it is we worship God. At the end of time, there will be two groups of people. One group is going to be saved, one group is not. Will there be agreement between the two groups of people about whether or not Christ died for us? Will they agree about Christ's death for them on the cross? We believe that Satan's going to show up as an angel of light. Everybody sees him there. Some people think it's Christ. Some people won't think it Christ uh, is Christ. But everybody's going to understand that Christ died for them. So do you worship Christ because he died for you or because he's the creator? It may depend on which day you end up worshiping. Yes, they will have agreement. One of the final messages to the world is, fear God, give glory to him because the hour of his judgment has come. Look at this, worship him who did what? Who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. It implies that God's people We'll worship God at the end of time because he is the creator. Do we hear much in sermons about God being the creator? We hear a lot about Christ being on the cross, don't we? 
and not to put that down. That tells us what kind of God we serve, right? But the reason why we serve him and worship him is because he's the creator. So if we go to Genesis 1, this is Moses, obviously, the first book of the Bible, the first chapter, first verse, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form of void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Apostle John starts his book, first chapter, first verse, with the same three words. Is it the same time period? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So our creator is Christ Jesus. And when it says in the beginning in John, is it the same as in the beginning God created? It's two different time periods, isn't it? He's our creator and our redeemer, Christ Jesus. We're going to go into Moses, Genesis 1, only we all know it pretty well, so I thought I'd take a shot at it. Since I'm up here, you get to do those kind of things. In a quiet zone, at a formless birth, the Spirit of God moved in, and he began to make the earth. With darkness everywhere, the thing that should be done was to create the light and get the work begun. The light shot all around. Darkness could not be found. Brightness was everywhere. At the end of that first day, the Lord just had to say, as he looked from where he stood, it's very good. The light was so clear, it shone so vividly as the Lord began to work on his next strategy. He put the waters up above and water down below. And in between, he put the air and the wind began to blow. Light shining through the atmosphere, color exploding everywhere. What a beautiful thing it was to see. And at the end of that second day, the Lord just had to say as he looked from where he stood, it is very good. He moved the waters down below with one stroke of his hand. And what was left behind became dry land. The dry land he called the earth, filled with jewels so perfectly in the bodies of water, he called the sea. Waves breaking on a sandy shore, flowers, hills, and trees, and so much more. The earth began to take shape suddenly. And at the end of that third day, the Lord just had to say, as he looked from where he stood, it is very good. And for the day, the sun was formed. It controlled the light, and it made things warm. And for the night, the moon and the stars and the planets were made like Jupiter and Mars. I have to tell you, last night we found a spelling error. We had a juniper, which I'm glad I found. <laughs> juniper and Mars. Supporting life, that fiery wall, the moon and stars, he made them all to mark the seasons, times, and years. At the end of that fourth day, the Lord just had to say, as he looked from where he stood, it's very good. Waters bring forth the living things. Birds fill the sky, swim down to the deepest depths, and fly so very high. He also spoke to them, be fruitful and multiply. And they were filled as he spoke the word, the sea and sky. Eagles and whales and turtles and trout, penguins and doves were all about, and porpoise and starfish were there too. And at the end of that fifth day, the Lord just had to say, as he looked from where he stood, it's very good. Cattle, 
reptiles and wild beasts were the next things to be made. They were placed upon the earth where they all lived and played. And then the greatest thing the Lord had in his plan, in a likeness of himself, he created man. Lions, leopards, cats and dogs, elephants and hippos and big fat hogs and horses and kangaroos for men to rule. At the end of that sixth day, the Lord had someone in whom to say as he looked from where he stood, you are very good. Now after all the work he'd done, the Lord took a rest and everything that he'd made seemed to like that day best. For as busy as the Lord then was, he'd leave his throne above and come and spend time with them and show them of his love. And his glory filled the land as he came to be with man. And the joy of that day is for us to know that at the end of the seventh day, he gave the whole earth away. To man I give this ecstasy to remind them of me. To remind them of me. Of me. Remember. David has a song in his book, King David's Greatest Hits, page 104. Praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. This song he has in a creative uh, order, just like what Moses did. So let's go through it and let's see if there's something else we can learn about God, the Creator. You are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. I was always concerned in the first one. In Moses, he says, let there be light. There is no sun. What's he doing? Why does he say, let there be light? David has an interesting concept here. He wraps himself in light as with a garment so that he can see what it is he's doing. He stretches out the heavens like a tent. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his wind his messengers. He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. You set boundary that cannot cross. They cannot cross. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow, and the trees of the Lord are well watered. The cedars of Lebanon that he planted. The moon marks off the seasons, and the sun knows when to go down. You bring the darkness, it becomes night. There is a sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures. Beyond number, living things, both large and small, and the Levathon which you formed to frolic there. The trees of the earth are well watered. There the birds make their nests. The stork has its home in the pine trees. The high mountains belong to the wild goats. The crags are a refuge for the conies. All the beasts of the forest prowl. The lion roars for their prey and seek their food from God. The sun rises, and they steal away. They return and lie down in their dens. Then man goes out to work, to his labor until evening. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. One more we're going to look at. You know this story but you may not have known that it's in a creation order also. And uh, God, our creator, Christ, he's a great teacher. He asks questions, as all teachers do or should do. It goes like this, and the Lord answered Job out of the storm. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? 
Who marked off its dimensions? Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Who or who laid this cornerstone? What is the way to the abode of light? Where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed or the way where the east winds scatter the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you, here we are? Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Who cuts a channel for the torrent of rain and a path for the thunderstorm to water a land where no man lives? a desert with no one in it to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass. Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the dewdrops? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons? Who provides for the raven when its young cry out to God? The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully. They don't do anything, but they flap. But they cannot compare to the pinions and the feathers of the stork. She, the ostrich, lays her eggs on the ground and lets them warm in the sun, unmindful that a foot may crush them. Why does she do that? For God did not endow her with good sense. Take a look at her there. Yet when she spreads her feathers to run, she has a talent. She can move. She laughs at the horse and the rider. Does a hawk take flight? by your wisdom and spread his wings toward the south? Let me tell you a little bit about that hawk. That hawk is a Harris hawk. It's about a foot and a half high. It's a baby. Did you know that Harris hawks had to pass ground school? They get knocked out of their nest, literally. And they flip and plop and tumble and flip and plop and they hit the ground pretty hard. And then they're down there. And they've got to learn to fly. I first spotted him in our backyard, and uh, mom and dad were sitting up in the trees up above, and one uncle or aunt, and they watched him. And he's, if you see his look, he looks like, I'm a Harris Hawk, leave me alone. He had an attitude. Well, <clears throat> in our backyard, we had a chain link fence, and I had a shop, and a big pine tree, and a bunch of uh, fruit trees. And several weeks earlier, I had gotten a little road runner back into there. It's a baby. And he couldn't get out of there. By the second day, I figured I'd better go in and try to help him. The cool part about road runners, I really like road runners. If you could, if you could hook two little arms like this right under their head, they'd look like little raptors running around. And uh, anyway, I tried to usher him out of that area. Have you ever tried to herd cats? Birds of 3D, okay? And I couldn't get him out of there. So I ended up trapping him into the corner, and you never know what's going to happen to you when you grab onto one of these things. But you can see him there. He wasn't very big. 
and uh, got a hold of him. I took him out past the gate out there on the right and left-hand side and put him in the desert, and he ran off. And about every four months, they come back to eat the lizards and the bugs and the things, that scorpions that they like. And so I was standing out there by that, by that wall, and this roadrunner jumped up on the wall, and they kind of have different markings uh, right here on their eyes. And uh, I said, you kind of look familiar. And he ran over to the edge of the wall and ran right to me, stood right there. And about every four months, I would see him. He would show up and run around and eat our bugs. So this little Harris got caught back in the same place. And so I didn't know if uh, I get my scent on it or not, that the parents and everybody's watching you know, what you're doing. And so I got a little sheet and I threw it over the top of him and put him into the backyard. And that look he had in his eye went away. And the third day went by and the fourth day went by and the fifth day went by and he's not being fed. They sit up there and they watch. The sixth day I couldn't find. I went out behind some bushes, and his wings were out like this, and his head was like that, and he had died. And so when the text says, does the hawk take flight by your wisdom? I can tell you it does not. Does the eagle soar at your command and build his nest on high? He dwells on a cliff and stays there at night. A rocky crag is his stronghold. From there he seeks his food. His eyes detect it from afar. Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lay in a wait in the thicket? Do you know when the mountain, lion, a mountain goat gives birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Who let the wild donkey go free? Who untied his ropes? I gave him the wasteland as his home, the salt flats as his habitat. Will the wild ox consent to serve you, one of the meanest animals in Africa? My parents were missionaries over there were these guys. You didn't get near them. Will they consent to serve you? Will they stay by your manger at night? Did you give the horse his strength? Clothed his neck with a flowing mane. He paws fiercely, rejoicing in his strength. He charges into the fray. And this is how we do it today. In frenzy's excitement, he eats up the ground. He cannot stand still when the trumpet sounds. What we learned earlier, I think it would be really fun to have some horse races and throw a couple of these guys in and see who wins. Who endowed the heart with wisdom? Or gave understanding to the mind. Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? John the Revelator praises God in Revelation. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. The book, The Woman and the Beast in the Book of Revelation by Lewis Wurr, he's an Adventist pastor from Australia. One of the best books I ever read on Revelation, written in the 1950s. Is there anything in his vast creation that was created without reference to numbers? He determines the number, David says, of the stars. He calls them each by their names. Think how many solar systems and stars are just in those five pictures. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, he who created these things, that bringeth, them, bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them by names and by the greatness of his might. From the mighty orbs that act as luminous hands in the heavenly chronometer, moving across faultless, with faultless pre precision, according to the mathematical determined speed across the vaulted dome, to the minutia on this planet. All things are governed 
by mathematical law. We know that the times for the rising and the setting of the sun, moon, and stars, we can predict them. The ebb and flow of the tides, seasons coming and going, the whole course of nature, whether of animal, plant life, are governed by a definite mathematical law. Sir James Jean, in his book, The Mysterious Universe, in delving into the deeper things of science, says, a scientific study of the actions of the universe has suggested a conclusion which may be summed up in a statement that the universe appears to have been designed by a pure mathematician. Did you know the Bible says that as well? It's a famous text that we all know is Daniel 8, 14, unto 2,300 days. But this text, the one before, it says this, and I heard one saint speaking unto another saint, and another saint said unto that certain saint, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? So we have the 2,300 days, and then the next chapter we have the 70 weeks, and it's talking about that certain saint the verse before that. This is Aramaic. The word is palimony. That's in reference to Christ, the creator. Now, I have three references here. One is the King James Bible. If you have any King James Bible with a margin in it, it will say palimony in it, and it will tell you some other definitions. Uh, the Woman and the Beast, to which I mentioned before, that book has it. And just get on Wikipedia and put in palimony. Palimony can also be interpreted as the number of secrets, a wonderful number. So we know that our creator is a pure mathematician. Now, I found this on the internet. It took me about six or seven hours to put together the next 15 slides trying to figure out what on earth these people were talking about. Dr. Jason Lyle. He has a Biblical Science Institute. He uses that, and he gives lectures uh, countering evolutionists. He is an astrophysicist from the University of Colorado, and he's right if you get on the Internet. He's got great stuff on Genesis. I thought he was an Adventist right at first. I think someday he's going to talk himself into it. He just listens a little closely to what he does. But he believes that there's a code in numbers. And that code reveals the intelligence of the person who made numbers and the creation. In other words, a signature. So we're going to do some math. If you didn't like math, hang on. Okay? Tried to make it as simple as I could. I'm fairly simple, so it's got to be easy. So we have sets of numbers, because we're going to look at some numbers. We're going to look at a set of numbers, and I want to know if you've ever heard of this set when we get there. The people in Durango had never heard of it before. Our study group on Tuesday night had never heard of it before, so I'm just kind of curious to see whether you've heard of this before. Negative numbers. A set of negative numbers looks like that. They all have to be negative, and you can have a whole bunch of them or just a few. But remember what sets of numbers are. Numbers divisible by three. There's a set of numbers divisible by three. Even numbers, under 100. Okay, there's a set of those. So we remember what sets are. Negative and positive number line. Okay, everything on the left side is negative. Everything on the right side is positive with a zero in the middle. And we're all fairly familiar with that. However, these are called real numbers. And there's a set of numbers. And don't ask me to explain it too much. But there's, there's a set of numbers called imaginary and fictitious. They're not on the number line. They're there. They have a little eye behind each number. Imaginary and fictitious, and those make a little grid like this. We're used to an XY grid. This is an XI grid. Okay? Complex numbers. Complex numbers are real and fictitious numbers combined. Okay? So they combine them on this grid. So that one would be a negative two, an imaginary number four. We'd have imaginary number minus 5 and minus 1. We'd have uh, imaginary number 2 and 3. You get the idea. Okay. Mandelbrot set. Anybody ever heard of this? 
<laughs> people in the class, Tuesday night, you don't count. Well, you do, but not right now. Okay, so nobody's heard of this. All right, this is Scientific American, a journal. It says, the April 1990 issue, it says this about the Mandelbrot set. The most complex object in mathematics. Discovered in the 1980s by Benoit Mandelbrot. And we don't know the exact date because there's two or three scientists that are arguing over whether or not they came up with this or not. But it was in the 80s. And the reason why it's in the 80s is because, if you remember, we all started getting personal computers. And we had stuff that we could begin to, to do things that were great. And it took computers to work on this Mandelbrot set because you'll see it's a little bit more different. There's the formula for the Mandelbrot set. So let me work with that with you for just a second. We'll get rid of those ends real quickly, OK? Because the, the n on the right side, the z that's squared with that n, it just is a number you put in like the number 1. Okay? And you solve the equation, and then you put that number 1 in the z on the other side, so that would be z2. And you take the solution, and you keep putting it where z is, and so you have z3, 4, 5, 6, 7, trying to determine numbers for the Mandelbrot set. So here's how it works. To determine if a number is part of the Mandelbrot set, a number is placed in the formula at C. So we take C and we make that 1. That's the number we're trying to see that belongs to the Mandelbrot set. Uh, then start with 0 where the Z is located and solve the formula. Then replace the Z with the solution and solve again. Okay, so here's how it works. So we're going to put 1 where the C is, and we're going to put a 0 where the Z is. And what is 0 squared? It's 0, right? So there's an easy, that's an easy formula, isn't it? If we take the 1 and put it over there, 1 squared is 1 plus 1 is 2. We put the 2 and put it over where the Z is. 2 squared is 4, so that would be 5. You put the 5 over to where the Z is. If I bored you out of your mind yet, 25 plus 1 is 26. If I take 26 and put it over there, it's a big number. All right, 676 plus 1 is 677. Is 1 part of the Mandelbrot set? No, it is not. Why not? If the solution keeps getting higher, then whatever number is being tested is not part of the Mandelbrot set. The solution has to stay small. So let's try a negative 1. Do the same thing. We already know that 0 squared is 0 plus a negative 1 is negative 1. So we take the negative 1 and put it in there, and we square it. And what do we got? We have 1 plus negative 1 is 0. Now we put the 0 over, and we square that. And that's the same thing as the first line, isn't it? So negative 1 is part of the Mandelbrot set, right? Mandelbrot used to take the numbers that belonged to the Mandelbrot set, and he made them black, and they began to see patterns. And this is why it had to work with computers, because all they could do is see these patterns, and it was difficult to do. And all the rest of the numbers that didn't belong to the Mandelbrot set, you could make whatever color you wanted to. And when they did this, this absolutely shocked them. This is called a cardioid, and that's what it looked like. Now, I could tell you all kinds of things about it. We're running out of time. But basically, what I want to tell you is if you look off on that little line going out on the left side, you can see another black spot out there. That's another one of these cardioids. And there's one right beside that. There's one right beside that. What these things are that are incredible is that they are infinitive. You can zoom in on this cardioid, and it never quits. So I don't care what size your computer is, eventually your computer is going to slow down and it's going to stop because it cannot get to infinity, which is what these are. They have fractals that you see when you start moving into that cardioid that look like that. And they keep growing. The most common fractal, the most famous fractal is the Mandelbrot set. It is the most famous object in modern mathematics. It is the breeding ground for the world's most famous fractals. Why am I concerned about this? Why are we talking about it? How do you make something that's infinite? You can't. It takes a mind. 
that it doesn't just take your and my mind, it takes God's mind to do this. He has given us proof that he's the creator with this. In mathematics, a fractal is a geometric shape containing detailed structure. This is a definition of a fractal. Detailed structure in arbitrarily small scales, usually having a fractal dimension strictly exceeding the topological dimension. That didn't help me at all. So I understood this one better. A fractal is a never-ending pattern. Here's what some of the other ones look like as the further you go down into them. There are four types of fractals. Complexity and simplicity, fractional di uh, dimension, infinite intricacy, and zoom symmetry. symmetry. More shapes. Now here's some of the interesting things. These fractals are found in our physical world. Um, the creation of the universe was accomplished by mathematical law. Fractals are a development of mathematics and also are in the physical world. And the physical world obeys mathematical law. So here are some things that have fractal proportions to them. Clouds, mountain, coastlines, cauliflower, ferns, the Eiffel Tower, snowflakes, peacock feathers, pineapples, lightning, fingerprints. And the structure of the DNA, our brains are full of fractals. An example is the connectivity of our neurons. Also, many of our internal organs and structures display fractal properties. God creates this thing, and there are things inside these fractals that we can see around us that he made off of these fractals. The Barnsley Fern Fractal looks kind of familiar, doesn't it? That fractal is endless. As it goes off into the distance, it's endless. You can pick one of those branches, and it's exactly what you're looking at is the whole. Well, every one of those branches is infinite. And guess what? There it is. Here's one. I thought it kind of looked like this. If you turn the iris sideways, it might look like that fractal. How about a nautilus shell? How about a octopus? I love this fractal here because this fractal, if they painted the whole thing green, it finally gave me reason to know why there was this, this item in the universe because it made no sense to me. Who cares about broccoli? <laughs> now it has some value. Okay? And look at this. This isn't just in our physical environment. It's universal. Just about done here. As never before, and this is written by Wuer, as never before, men now see that everything in nature is controlled by mathematical law and principles. And this is fascinating. The laws of math are conceptual. Okay? So uh, what that means is well, the numbers are all in your head, right? Uh, they're not something out here. They're, they're in your head. So mathematical concepts are in your mind. They're universal. Anywhere you go in the universe, 3 plus 3 is 6. They're invariant. They're unaffected by time. They're exceptionalists. Always the same. A number never evolves. 4 never goes to 6. And then look at this. God, his thoughts are conceptual. He's omnipresent. He's universal. He's invariant. He's unaffected by time. In fact, he can move through it. He's exceptionalist, always the same. He never changes. Numbers are abstract conceptions of quantity. That's a definition of a number. Abstract concepts, order, and patterns require a mind. Beauty of infinite complexity is built into numbers. Infinite complexity requires God's mind. Numbers are therefore a reflection of how God thinks and creates. The universe is controlled by the mind of God. The mathematics God has given us access 
to sum up his thoughts. How is mankind able to discover these laws? We already told you. Daniel 8, 13, palimony, the number of secrets, the wonderful number, the creator God. And we are part of his creation. And not only that, we are created in his image. And so we can pick this stuff up. With fractals, we see design, patterns, complexity, organization, simplicity. They're not random. It didn't just happen. They're thought out. It took a mind to develop and create them. Fractals are infinite. God is infinite. To have fractals, there must be infinite intelligence. A creator who made them. Without him, nothing was made that was made, including fractals. Since the mid-1980s, after approximately 5,000 954 years from the fall, the development of computers, the discovery of the Mandelbrot set, cardioids, and fractals. God has left his signature for modern man to find. Infinite patterns that are based on mathematical formulas that require the mind of an infinite being, God, Jesus, our creator, our redeemer. David, at the end of his song, page 104, he starts it in verse 1, praise the Lord, O my soul, and he ends it the same way. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his work. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God. As long as I live, may my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul, praise the Lord.